So today we're going to be talking about um, identifying children with uh, low vision, and I'm going to go through what is low vision, what do we do in our low vision clinic, and how do we identify those kiddos. So first I kind of just wanted to start off by talking about what is vision. When we think about vision, we think about visual acuity, and that is just a quantification of vision. It doesn't tell us much about the quality of vision, so vision is really more a culmination of visual acuity, eye movement, eye teaming skills, depth perception, color vision, visual field, and then of course processing of vision in our brain. So why is this important? Well, early on, they say about 80% of what we learn comes in visually, and our kiddos with vision impairment are, no, are known to have multiple developmental delays early on. So identifying these kiddos early so we can, just like any any other developmentally delayed kid, early intervention is always better. So what is low vision? So low vision is a term that is used to describe um, vision impairment that's not corrected by our standard glasses, contacts, surgery, or medicine. And um, in 2016, the um, American Association of the, for the Blind came out with a statistic that there are 60,000 children in the state of Texas that identified as having an impairment in vision. And that number decreases significantly when we filter it out by visually impaired versus legally blind. But if that truly is our number, then I think that there's a fair amount of kiddos that are kind of falling through the cracks that we're missing. So I wanted to go through and um, talk about, we have two definitions for low vision. We have a clinical definition and we have a functional definition. And our clinical definition is kind of our medical legal term. This is, this is how we define who gets services. And so visual impairment is characterized as a best corrected vision of 2070 or worse, and a visual field of, or not and, or a visual field of 30 degrees or less whereas legal blindness is 2200 or worse and a visual field of 20 degrees or less. And then if we go into our functional definition, well, this is any level of vision that impairs our activities of daily living. So activities of daily living, eating, dressing ourselves, recreational activities, reading, writing, cooking, all these sorts of things. And um, it is important to note that to be characterized as having low vision, you do have to have some usable vision, whereas blindness is a child who has a vision impairment that is not able to use their vision. So for um, to be characterized as low vision, you have to have some usable vision that we can maximize with either modifications or with actual devices. So um, what causes vision impairment? This is a picture of kiddos. They are twins, and obviously one of them has oculocutaneous albinism. So sometimes we can get an idea about if they're going to have a vision impairment just by looking at the kid, oculocutaneous albinism being the most prominent, fair-skinned, fair eye, fair, or they have very little pigment in their eyes, and they have um, lightly colored hair, and they, they usually have nystagmus or the shaking of the eyes. Um, and then we frequently see kiddos with optic nerve hypoplasia, optic atrophy, kiddos with, um, who've had congenital cataracts removed, and then, um, of course, our kiddos with retinopathy of prematurity. But I still see teenagers with vision loss from retinopathy of prematurity, but the number of kiddos that are visually impaired because of retinopathy of prematurity has decreased substantially because our care of our preemies has um, gotten so good and they're receiving less oxygen, and um, so they're requiring less, they're, less kiddos are requiring treatment, thankfully. And then, of course, our inherited retinal dystrophies such as retinitis pigmentosa, Stargardt's, rod cone, achromatopsia, aniridia, these sorts of things. And then being at Texas Children's, we see kiddos from all different walks of life and levels of abilities. And so we do see kiddos with traumatic brain injury and a fair amount of kiddos with cortical visual impairment. And cortical visual impairment is when, generally speaking, the eyes are healthy, but the brain is not properly interpreting vision. 
So how do these diseases impair vision? Of course, what the first thing we're thinking of is they decrease visual acuity, they cause blurred vision, um, but they also frequently cause loss of side or peripheral vision, which um, is especially important if they have like left-sided vision loss and we read left to right. So that often affects um, ability to read and requires some compensation and different strategies to help them with that. And then contrast sensitivity. If they have decreased contrast sensitivity, the number one thing that parents and therapists report is difficulty navigating steps. And then um, depending on what type of eye disease they have, they may have impairment in color vision as well. So why refer? Well, these kids obviously need eye care. They need a normal, standard, annual, comprehensive, dilated eye exam. We need to be checking on the health of their eyes, and we need to make sure that they're in their most um, appropriate glasses. And then in our low vision evaluation, so your normal eye exam is looking at the health of the eyes, and a low vision assessment is looking at how are we using the vision that we have. So it's an assessment of visual function, and um, we want to look at how can we maximize how the child's using the vision that they have, and we maximize that by making modifications in their environment or through the form of assisted devices. So the number one thing or the first thing that I do is I do want to quantify their vision because I find that in my report this is something that is extremely important to therapists and teachers. They want to know what can the child see because obviously they want to be presenting um, materials that the child can easily read. Um, and then I double check their glasses. I do a refraction to make sure that they're in the most appropriate glasses. And then we go through how to optimize their vision. So there are some things that, um, that we can do, just modifications, simply bringing it closer using a reading stand or a lap desk. Um, our visually impaired kiddos frequently, the parents are like, they're always looking at the phone right here. And um, I have to reassure the parents, it's OK for the child to bring things closer because they're just making it bigger. And then we do prescribe high-powered reading glasses. And sometimes we even do a bifocal in the child's glasses help them get a little bit of magnification up close. So our patients with um, aniridia and albinism are frequently light sensitive. And so we often are doing certain types of filters. They need a hat or a visor when outside. Um, kiddos who struggle with contrast, they also can have specialty tinted lenses to help enhance the contrast. And then simple things, just making what we're already using bigger. So not just using our college ruled paper, but using an actual, sometimes wide ruled is enough, but oftentimes large ruled paper, uh, like a felt tip pen instead of a number two pencil, the contrast is often too, um, too low and they can't see the pencil, they can't even read their own handwriting. Um, and then like a large print calculator or an enlarged remote, so simple things like that. And then um, now we're kind of getting into some of the devices that we use. These are two of my favorites. Um, the one on the bottom is a dome magnifier, and um, we see kiddos starting out pretty young, as young as three or four, and when we're starting out at three or four, everything that they're, the materials that they're working with are actually quite big, so they're able to see most of the things for most kids, um, but it's good to go ahead and introduce them to devices because they're going to need these throughout the entirety of their life, and I love the dome magnifier because it has a nice big field of view, and it's really easy to just slide along the page, and it um, magnifies whatever they're looking at. And then above that, for some of my a little bit older school age kids, that is called an easy pocket. And when it's closed, it's about the size of a credit card. And so it's really easy to slip in a pocket or put in a backpack. And it's great for spotting. Like if you go to a restaurant, you whip it out, it has a nice light, helps you read the menu, little things like that. So when we get into distance magnification, it's a little more complicated. Um, this lady here is using um, a spectacle-mounted telescope. It's a specialty one called a bioptic. And um, it's really cool. You just kind of dip your chin down and look through a little hole, and it magnifies a certain magnification, um, whatever you're looking at. So you, um, if a person can, be, can achieve a visual acuity of 20-40 with the telescope, they actually can... Um, 
they can obtain a restricted driver's license, which driving is obviously a huge freedom. And so, you know, most of these people have never even dreamt that their child could drive. So this is a, a really neat possibility. College kids love these for auditorium seating like this so they can see what's um, up on the board. And just this week, I had a kiddo, I was kind of going through my standard stuff and she's, uh, She's 15, and she has oculocutaneous albinism. And she's like, oh, yeah, I've tried that. It doesn't work. Oh, I've tried that. It doesn't work. And um, we put the telescope on. We put one, a bioptic on her, and she was like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. And, um, and she was able to just read down my chart really quickly without any training, which is really impressive. And um, her grandma's over there just crying. Um, but she is a musician, and she wants to try out for HSPVA, the High School of the Visual Performing Arts. And... Um, and so I'm thinking for her, there's an autofocus uh, telescope like that. So that's really cool because she can, it autofocuses for her sheet music, but she also could use it in the classroom for distance. And, um, and I was, first I was showing her that we have handheld telescopes, and I was kind of showing her that. And she's like, yeah, well, I would use this if it was like on my glasses or something. I'd have to hold it all the time. And I was like, oh, well, let me bring this out. <laughs> and um, so it's, re it's really fun to see their response. And even with the handheld magnifiers and with these electronic devices, to see the family's response when they're like, oh, my child can't really read. And sure enough, in the initial stages, this I, I tell parents, this exam is kind of like going to an OT or PT session. You're going to come here and work really hard. We're going to get a lot of me measurements of vision. We get like a baseline measurement, and then we get measurements with all the devices. Um, and so, but it's really cool to see them. I have a continuous text card where they read sentences, and they um, often kind of fumble through. They can quickly name the letters when we're doing like an acuity chart, and then we switch to the sentence, and all of a sudden we're really slowly reading. And then you put a little bit of magnification, and all of a sudden the child's a fluid reader. And then the parents is in tears because they're like, I've never heard my child read like this. Um, so that's my big job is to make the vision portion easy so the child can focus on learning. Um, so there are a lot of cool electronic devices available. This is a closed circuit television or a CCTV. This is a desktop one, and it's basically like a computer screen, and it has a camera. You can slip anything underneath it. It magnifies. They go up to like 20 times, and you can manipulate the colors um, if they have issues with contrast. And so they're very simple and easy to use, and they what's really popular in schools right now are the that used to be you would cart this around from class to class, which obviously is cumbersome for the child, and they don't like that. But now they've made several handheld CCTVs that look more like a tablet or a device, and so obviously that's more attractive because you know, visually impaired kiddos are just like all our other kiddos. They don't want to appear disabled. They don't want to appear different, um, but they need help. And so it's cool to give them a device that maybe their peers would think is cool too. And then in terms of computer software, we all recognize Dragon, something we're using in our offices every day, but also available to visually impaired kids. There's tons of software that um, magnifies the, their screen and then also text-to-speech and um, speech-to-text. And then really, it's really amazing, this um, generation of visually impaired kids is going to be totally different than any other generation before them because they really have access to so much through Kindle, iPad, computer, um, and the accessibility uh, features that are already built into these devices. And of course, they all know how to use them all without anybody teaching them. <laughs> um, so my big job is equipping the family with a, making my recommendations in terms of which devices and magnification, of course, um, but then also providing them with a thorough report to provide to the school and a state I report. And a state I report is what we give over to Texas Workforce Commission, and that is the state's um, Health and Human Services and Department for the Blind, so that the child can get services um, through the state. A lot of everything that I'm prescribing is not covered by insurance, and they're often very expensive devices, but through the assistance of the state, they can help get things for their house, and then through their local school district, they're provided everything they need in school, or at least they should be. And then I also like to equip my families with um, 
information about local support groups and resources like um, Lighthouse for the Blind, which has different groups based on age, and they have all sorts of resources for visually impaired and blind um, children and adults. And then um, there's different groups like iBug, which is an Apple users group for visually impaired people. And so similarly, if they need, um, if they need extra help learning how to use the devices that we've given them, then there are certain occupational therapists who specialize in vision. And they'll even go to their house because um, think about things like buttons on a microwave are difficult to see, and they'll add textile cues so that the child um, can cook their food in the microwave or on the stove or different things, just helping make sure that they can navigate even within their own home. And um, if they have a significant vision loss, we get orientation and mobility involved so that they can be learned how to use a cane. And um, social workers, vocational rehabilitation counselors through the state, and this is, a, this is an example of the I report, or this is the I report that I fill out. And they have to have this form to get services in school for vision. And they have to have this form in order to get services through the Department for the Blind. And it has to be filled out by an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. So, so when to refer your patients? It is, can be really tricky in a primary care setting to identify kids with visual impairment because they don't want to be identified as different, and they are good. If a kid walks in with 2070 vision, you might never know unless you do a vision screening because they can navigate the room just fine, and if they're not complaining about um, vision impairment. So that can be tough, but that's why your vision screenings are so important. Of course, if they have a history, a family history of blindness, or they have a personal history of eye disease. Um, but if you do a, a vision screening and they're 20, 70 or worse, or you have concern for peripheral visual, vision loss, that's certainly um, an indication for a referral. And then any kid that you know that has vision impairment um, and they haven't had a low vision evaluation in one to two years should be referred for a low vision evaluation to make sure. It is shocking to me the number of kiddos who are visually impaired that are getting no services in school and really struggling. Um, so, thank you all.